Hello, welcome to the Orthobiologics Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Trevor Turner, RMSK, brought to you by Georgia Bone and Joint. We are fortunate today in this new episode to be joined by Dr. Atluri, who is based in Cincinnati, Ohio. He runs a private practice there. You can find out more about it at stemcures.com. He's going to be talking today specifically about the application of bone marrow-derived stem cells into discs of both the lumbar, thoracic, and cervical spines. Dr. Atluri is notably a pioneer of stem cell therapy in the United States and is one of the few who performs both injections in the disc and into bone to treat both back and joint pain. He gives national talks where he teaches other physicians about stem cell therapy and is also a faculty at our annual meetings, including with the American Society of Interventional Pain, the Interventional Orthobiologics Foundation, and also the Orthobiologics Institute. He co-edited the largest textbook about regenerative medicine and pain management and is also part of the team that wrote the guidelines for the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians for the certification in regenerative medicine of which he is now actually an examiner to qualify other positions to be performing stem cell procedures. Uh, also, a very exciting addition is the fact that he is pioneering the first prospective controlled clinical trial to prove the efficacy of stem cell therapy to treat chronic low back pain here in the United States and as part of the team that did a systematic review to establish how effective stem cell therapy can be to treat back pain in the Journal of Pain Physician. Dr. Atluri, thank you so much for joining us today. If you would tell us a little bit about how you got on this path when you first started learning about it and considering offering this as a therapeutic option for patients with unremitting back pain. Uh, thank you for having me, Dr. Turner. i um, really excited to be here to, uh, today. So uh, I've been uh, doing interventional uh, spine work uh, for the last 25 years, and uh, we saw reasonable success with different uh, treatment modalities like radiofrequency, epidural, spinal cord stimulators. But I was always on the lookout uh, for something better to offer my patients. Um, and then about five years ago, um, Dr. Manchu Kanti, who's the president uh, of the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians, uh, told me about uh, the stem cell therapy and said I should look into it. And he was my inspiration. Um, and then I started uh, reading a lot and attending courses, uh, uh, educated myself, and then started about three and a half years ago. And it's been an amazing journey. And it's amazing. We, we kind of go back. We have questions from patients about, well, how long has this really been around and who's been doing it? And, and a lot of times we refer back sometimes to studies in Europe and certainly the work of Dr. Hernigo as, as the beginning of the field. But then kind of the use of bone marrow concentrate maybe in, in other places outside of the spine in kind of the mid-2000s it definitely seems like the use of bone marrow derived stem cells inside of spinal discs and bones and, and depending on what you're treating uh, is newer. And so, um, you know, I applaud you for obviously the approach of reading and learning and traveling and, and going everywhere you could to find out more, even as someone who was clearly obviously a very experienced and successful pain physician. So let me ask you, when you started to offer uh, procedures like this and, and a patient, you know, would come into your office and say, well, you know, I have degenerative disc. Uh, tell me a little bit about what does that conversation become like for you when a patient is asking? So uh, I uh, truly believe, and many studies are sh uh, showing that the, the biggest culprit uh, if you're talking about actual low back pain, I'm not talking about radicular pain with uh, nerve inflammation. And but Dr. Actually, Lee, could you could you just elaborate on that a little bit? I think medical professionals will know exactly what you mean, but when you say axial versus radicular, describe that. Yeah. Um, so when I say axial low back pain is the pain that uh, is localized to the lower back and goes across the back, usually 95% uh, of the pain is by your waistline. 
uh, it's either dead center or it goes across the back or to one side, but does not go to the buttock or down the leg. Uh, that's the majority of uh, chronic uh, low back pain. Okay. Um, and uh, it's very important to distinguish uh, at this point whether a uh, patient is having acute pain or chronic pain. Okay. Uh, uh, when I see patients who are having pain less than three months, um, usually uh, that acute pain subsides um, with uh, the usual therapies like uh, anti-inflammatory medications or some pain medications like Vicodin or Percocet, physical therapy, um, and uh, maybe simple injections. Um, it's it's a ninety percent of the acute pain gets better. Uh, with nothing or with these treatments. It's the chronic pain, which is a problem. Uh, once it lasts beyond six months, uh, unless we do something uh, dramatic, that pain is not going to go away and the patient will be suffering for years. And as you know, um, in, in medicine, uh, chronic low back pain is one of the most challenging conditions to treat. Uh, and that's the struggle that uh, most of us pain physicians uh, face every day uh, with what we have to offer them at this point. Uh, but uh, stem cells um, is a game changer. Uh, that's been my experience uh, and my patient's experience. Uh, and in my 25 years of practice, I've never seen uh, anything like uh, stem cells in terms of uh, patient responses. Not only uh, a high percentage of patients get better, but they get a high percentage of relief. Uh, I remember when I was a fellow, uh, we were shooting for, for a 50% reduction in pain. And that was like a holy grail moment. We got 50% reduction and we used to all give high fives. Uh, sure. But with the stem cells, um, we are seeing 80 to 100% uh, relief for a long time. Uh, sure. Uh, these patients who responded that I've done three and a half years ago, they're still doing well. Uh, right. The studies uh, in the spine, the longest study that we have by Dr. Patin, uh, even after five years, the pain hasn't come back. And uh, you mentioned uh, Dr. Hernigo in the knee. He has a study in the knee. Even after 12 years, the pain did not come back uh, when he did subchondral bone marrow therapy. Um so uh, the first thing that I do uh, is differentiate, uh, is it an acute pain or chronic pain? If it is an acute pain, I do not offer them stem cells. Uh, now, if it is a chronic pain, uh, when I first uh, started doing this, um, I wanted them to fail traditional therapy. Uh, by that, I mean they need to fail epidurals, they need to fail radiofrequency. Uh, not spinal cord stimulator, but SI joints, radio frequency, and epidural injections, because that's covered by insurance. Right. Um, and as you know, um, these don't last long, uh, but they're better than nothing. Uh, uh, they offer pain relief to patients that uh, the only other option would be surgery. So it's a good bridge. However, it's not perfect or ideal. Um, so now uh, my algorithm has changed after having this experience and seeing how, how well the patients are doing. Uh, I asked them two questions uh, to see if they're a candidate for stem cells. One, is your chronic low back pain affecting your lifestyle? If they say yes, uh, then uh, I consider them as candidates. If they say no, then I don't offer it to them. It, okay. it has to be severe enough that it is affecting their lifestyle. Uh, the second question is, uh, since it's not covered by insurance, uh, can you afford it? Uh, obviously, if they say no, they're not candidates, but if they can afford it, is uh, we offer it to them. So they need to meet two criteria. One is it chronic pain, actually three. Uh, chronic pain. Number two, uh, is it affecting their lifestyle? Number three, if they can afford it. So this is the way uh, we uh, evaluate the patient. Um, sure, and then I, I think you know we've we've talked a lot about that some of these patients, if the 
you know, they had an annular tear or, or, you know, depending on the, the diagnosis or the type of modic changes or some other kind of anatomical uh, things that are found on MRI um, were found in the past, we really didn't have a lot of other options for them because no amount of physical therapy or, or amount of other kind of regular injections or, or surgical, you know, discectomy seemed to really be uh, the ideal treatment for them. Um, and I think, you know, our spine surgeons, you know, here would certainly verify that as well. Um, do you find that a lot of the patients that you are seeing or have seen have kind of been told that, like they feel like they've exhausted most of their options by the time you've seen them? Or are you getting to a place now where people are, you know, they're kind of coming and seeking this option out as a, as a earlier option in the treatment paradigm? So most of... Uh... Uh, the referrals uh, that I get for stem cell therapy are uh, friends and family of the patients that I've treated uh, since they get. Uh, oh my gosh, where's the. It looks like we lost uh, Dr. Adluri for just a minute. So while he is dealing with some technical issues, we're going to take a brief pause. So um, the the most important thing is uh, you were asking about uh, annular tears and disc degeneration, modic changes. Um, I tell uh, patients that uh, unfortunately the MRIs uh, do not uh, absolutely correlate with pain. Um, we do see a ton of changes on the MRI, and uh, what. Uh, I have adopted is what is called as a shotgun approach, um, where, like I was mentioning earlier, most of the pain is by the waistline. So, is it? Uh, it's hard to tell. Uh, in spite of a proper uh, physical exam, diagnostic tests, uh, including um, selective nerve root blocks, discograms, uh, and MRI and CT findings, exactly which structure. Uh, is the pain generator? Uh, is it the L4-5 disc? Is it the L5-S1 disc? Is it the uh, L4-5 facet? Or is it the L5-S1 facet? Is it the SI joint? Um, it's hard to tell uh, for sure. Um, so what we do here is uh, inject everything. Um, the, the, the rationale being um, that I don't, the patients are paying a lot of money um, and I have one time chance to fix them. Uh, you're doing an invasive uh, procedure, which is bone marrow aspiration. And um, I know when I inject a normal structure, it's not gonna harm it, but I do not want to miss a, a pain generator. Um, so we inject everything and uh, that's been working uh, uh, so, and serving us uh, well. Um, so uh, what's interesting, and in, in the study you will see uh, that uh, if you look at any study that has been done so far, uh, they look at um, at least having a 50% uh, collapse of the disc. Uh, they need the disc to be maintained uh, more than 50% before they inject it in all the studies. Uh, okay, and specifically there, Dr. Lee, when you mention collapse of the disc, you're talking about when you look at an MRI and you actually measure how tall the disc is between the bones, correct? That's exactly right. And right. Uh, as you age and uh, with your sports injuries and because of genetics, uh, most patients have uh, decreased in the disc height. The cushion between the bones uh, collapses. And so uh, our patients, uh, we don't care. Uh, even if there is a 90% collapse, as long as I can uh, get the needle in, we, we, we did it uh, in the study. And, and that's how we wow. treat our, uh, our regular patients too. Um, so regardless of how bad the arthritis is, 
uh, in the facet joints or how bad the disc is uh, uh, protruded or collapsed or herniated. Um, as long as they're not having neurological symptoms, uh, like a weak leg or severe numbness and tingling in the leg, uh, uh, we are doing the procedure. Um, uh, and that's what the control, the, the study group uh, uh, consists of. Um, we did not carefully screen the patients uh, as long as they're having back pain and it's chronic um, and they're willing to get the procedure done. Uh, those are the patients we've included in the study because we wanted to show that uh, any back pain, which is coming from the spine, um, we can treat with stem cells. And uh, I truly believe that majority of the low back pain is actually coming from the discs. Mm -hmm. uh, and many independent uh, studies uh, have shown that disc is the main culprit. And uh, if you think about it, it's just not the disc. It's a complex. Um, so there is the disc and uh, 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 at the bottom of the disc and on top of the disc, there is this vertebral end plate, which is the cartilage. And uh, next to the cartilage is the bone, uh, which is a subchondral bone. Uh, most of the nerves are in the outer ring of the disc and also in the cartilage, and also in the bone, in the subchondral bone. Uh, and that's where all the inflammation is happening. Um, the center of the disc, which is called the nucleus pulposus, which is a jelly part or the soft part of the disc, does not have any nerves at all. So when I uh, put the needle in the center of the disc and put stem cells there, mm -hmm. uh, especially in degenerated discs, um, the cartilage is broken uh, and that uh, stem cell solution leaks uh, to the cartilage and also to the subchondral bone. So lately what we're doing is we're actually even injecting the annulus um, also, which we were not doing before. I mean, this whole field is evolving. We're trying to make changes um, to improve our results from 70 to 80% to 90%. Um, wow. So, uh, and again, um, Dr. Turner, we are talking about patients who have had back pain for years, who've seen multiple doctors, who had multiple treatments, uh, multiple different kinds of medications. Those are the patients that we're treating here. Um, and we want to prove that uh, this therapy is uh, very helpful in those kind of challenging patients. Um, so that's the control group. Uh, sorry, that's the study group. And in the control group, uh, we have 40 patients in each group. Okay. We finished enrolling. Uh, the study is completed. Now we're waiting for the data. In the control group, we have patients uh, who did not want stem cells or could not afford it but they were getting traditional treatments like uh, opioids, mostly opioids, and mm -hmm. uh, some patients get interventions. Um, and uh, we, we will be following them for one year. And uh, so we have uh, some data, a three month and a six month data on some patients, uh, and it's looking very promising. And, right. and this is the first study which actually uh, has uh, discs, facets, uh, and in some patients, SI joints um, injected, uh, and patients who are having radicular pain or pain sciatica, which is commonly called, where pain goes down the leg, uh, we've injected epidural stem cells. Uh, there is no study so far which has evaluated uh, the bone marrow stem cells uh, into the facets, SI joint, or the epidural space. All the studies that have come so far, very few, uh, they're all in the disc space. Uh, so it's, it's gonna be a landmark study in that nature because we're publishing that for the first time that yes, these structures can also be injected and it is safe and it works. Let's talk about that. You mentioned safe. So, you know, I, I always find that when I'm having a discussion with a patient about, uh, you know, potentially doing an intradiscal procedure, you know, we, we talk about this risk of discitis and, and just how, you know, severe a complication from that could be compared to maybe some 
you know, complications that might not be as serious with, with, you know, less invasive or lower risk kind of procedures. How do you have that conversation? And, you know, what, I, I know there's published statistics about the rate of, of discitis kind of when you're doing interdiscal work, but um, talk about how you talk about that with people who, who want to know if this is a safe treatment as long as a, an effective one. So uh, I'm glad you brought this up, uh, Dr. Turner, because discitis is a real risk. Um, and it did happen to me. I had one case, um, I don't know, I must have done, uh, I don't know, about 120 patients so far. And each patient, like I told you, uh, gets at least two discs. Uh, some of them get three discs, depending on the location of pain and what we find on the MRI. So you're talking about uh, 250 to 300 discs that I've done so far. One disc got infected. Mm. Um, and to me, uh, and for most of us, uh, uh, it's like a plane crash. One one uh, crash is too many. Um, um it's a pain uh, because it is a very painful condition. It takes a long time for them to get better. And they're on antibiotics for a long time. Um, you know, I tell my patients that there's a risk with any procedure. Um, sure. And, and uh, like you mentioned, uh, each procedure has a unique risk. So discitis is, is a, a peculiar uh, complication with this procedure. Uh, it is real, but uh, it is extremely rare. Uh, and you have to do whatever it takes uh, almost to a, a paranoid level of uh, precautions uh, to avoid it. Um, so we use uh, uh, IV antibiotics before the procedure. We put them on PO. We put them on PO antibiotics for 10 days after the procedure. Oh, wow. And uh, the... Um, I don't let anybody uh, do the procedure. I do my own aspiration. I do my own uh, 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 concentration. Um, I do my own prep. I perform it like surgery, prepped and gowned like a surgeon. Um, so um, uh, I, I, almost like, like I was mentioning uh, a paranoia level of uh, sterility, uh, but it still happened. Uh, and I'm sure it will happen, but the results that we're seeing uh, is so astounding that uh, I will not give up. And also, um, like I mentioned, it is a rare, very rare complication. Um, the other way to look at it is, uh, 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 I mean, discitis is a known complication even after surgery. Uh, sure. and, and the incidence is much higher uh, if you look at the risk of discitis versus biologics. Uh, but we should respect it. We should be careful and uh, do whatever it takes to prevent that. I'm going to take kind of a weird angle on that. So um, there's kind of been some recent discussion in the literature about a microbiome of the disc. And I think you know, a lot of people now who are reading about health and, and wellness are, are, you know, looking at, well, we have bacteria in our gut and that bacteria is good and that's why we should eat probiotics or eat certain foods and nourish those things. And I, I think lately there's been kind of some papers about how there actually is native bacteria around the disc. And certainly what I was taught in medical school was that a, a disc was kind of a sterile structure. So that was that was kind of a a departure from, you know, what I consider to be, you know, dogma, I guess, as, as I was educated. Do you think that using bone marrow concentrate somehow alters or restores the, the natural balance kind of, of bacteria around the disc? Do you have an opinion on that? So there are two schools of thought, Dr. Turner. One is, um, like you said, there is uh, P. acnes. Uh, that's the most common bacteria interdiscally. And when you inject uh, a bone marrow into the disc, uh, is it acting like a petri dish and uh, helping proliferation and uh, increasing the survival of the bacteria? That's one school of thought. Uh, the other school of thought 
uh, is um, you're taking bone marrow out of the patient's body, um, putting it in a centrifuge machine, concentrating it, taking it out, and then putting it back in the disc. Um, so is there a possibility of uh, contamination during this process? Um, because you're increasing the chances uh, of uh, infection uh, in this uh, uh, multi-step process. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I wish I knew. Um, and uh, the problem is, if it is external contamination, we can do something about it. Uh, if it is internal activation of the existing bacteria, you have zero control. Um, right. And again, recognizing that this is an issue and also uh, knowing that it's, it's, it's a rare complication, um, I think we need to move on, uh, identify it, understand it, respect it, but move on because it is so rare if you do it the right way. Great. Yeah. So, um, so question, I know that you have been involved in education in a lot of different forums. And I think you mentioned also that, you know, physicians even come and, you know, will sometimes fly to observe procedures with you at your practice. And as this technique, you know, as your data comes out and, and really shows that, you know, not only is this safe and, you know, effective for people who've failed other mechanisms, but, you know, it maybe suggests that there is a role to play in how we treat patients with chronic, you know, low back pain, maybe earlier in the treatment paradigm. How do you see the transformation of the the broader field of, you know, whether it's interventional pain or, you know, or fellowships or, you know, how, how do you see that the near future versus the longer term future in terms of being incorporated more into really the mainstream of how we educate physicians and recommend treatments to patients. Um, there are two bottlenecks uh, right now. Uh, one is the insurance is not covering it. So unfortunately um, it's a great treatment, but most patients can't uh, afford it. Um, so, but having said that, um, there is a lot of awareness uh, amongst uh, patients. Uh, either they hear from their friends or their family um, that how well this is doing. Uh, and, and this awareness is only going to increase. Um, the only reason is traditional medicine has failed uh, when it comes to treating back pain. Um, and so people are looking for alternatives. And uh, this has uh, been a life-changing uh, experience for the patients. Um, and, uh, you, know, you, you know, when they write uh, reviews uh, on Google, uh, that's a common thread that I see patients mentioning that this has been life-changing and uh, I'm doing things that I've never thought I would be able to do before. Um, so I think the awareness is only going to increase. Um, the second problem is uh, there are so many scamsters in every city uh, who are taking advantage of uh, desperate and vulner vulnerable patients, offering them um, scam stem cell therapies, which are not uh, using amniotic fluid, umbilical cord uh, stuff. Um, not injecting the right areas, uh, done by uh, poorly trained physicians or um, nurse practitioners and physician assistants. Um, it's, it's, it's for them, um, it's, it's, it's a business model. Uh, it's not a patient-centric model like most of us practice. Um, so that is uh, giving uh, the field a very bad name and uh, making it difficult to get approvals uh, because the government, including the FDA, wants to protect the patients, rightfully so. Right. Uh, but so they keep a lot of restrictions. Uh, now coming to training, uh, I do see uh, down the road, but it's a slow change. 
more and more academic uh, institutions adopting this technology uh, because patients will be asking, patients will be demanding, um, uh, you know, why don't you do it? I've heard it works really well. So and so that I know had it done and he or she is doing so well. Uh, I, I, but it's a slow change, uh, but I, I think it will happen. Um, but uh, I think uh, as there is more training, there's more awareness, even amongst physicians. Um, most physicians, uh, I'm not even talking about family doctors. I'm talking about even uh, pain physicians, uh, surgeons, uh, PMNR, sports medicine. Uh, very few of them know uh, enough about stem cells and the power of stem cells and what they can do. Yeah, certainly. And I think, you know, we're thankful to have, you know, people who are are having success that are, you know, courageous enough and committed enough to publish their results and to travel around and, and teach other people and not just say, you know, hey, I've got the secret sauce. Everybody, you know, you can come to my practice, but, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to disclose what's going on. I mean, I think the the people who are leading the field are doing what you're doing. And, and so we obviously thank you for that. Um, you know, if you, um, if you were going to impart, uh, I guess the last, uh, insight here before we wrap up, um, about, uh, how patients, you know, can find you and also find, you know, other groups or physicians that are, are doing this in a way that, uh, maintains that high quality standard or that high kind of ethical standard that we have for the image guided injections and, and, and for, you know, good science behind the endeavors, what, what would you recommend to them? So um, you can go on to my website. Uh, it's uh, stemcures.com. Um, I've written a few blogs uh, because this is uh, uh, very close to my heart, like how to identify a clinic uh, who's, who's really interested in you or in your wallet, uh, how to make this distinction. Um, um, you know, make sure uh, that the physician is, first of all, uh, 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 certified uh, in, in this field of uh, uh, the area of pain, like orthopedic, sports medicine, uh, interventional pain, uh, interventional radiology, um, and make sure that they got uh, special training, attended courses, learned, got certificates uh, of competency. Um, and ASIP uh, actually offers uh, a regenerative medicine certification. Uh, and I would encourage uh, all physicians who are interested in this field to get certified so it gives them some credibility. Um, and make sure uh, you, don't get, you don't get overcharged. Make sure, like you were saying, that they use uh, fluoroscopic guidance to uh, do precise and very specific uh, um, injections. Um, so the different ways to uh, find out, um, and that's what I would caution, um, because um, patients are looking. Uh, and there was a there was a article uh, in uh, one of the ju- medical journals. They looked at the uh, number of people on Google uh, looking for stem cell therapy for knees and hips, and there's an increasing uh, trend uh, over the years. Um, so, but at the same time, they have to be um, careful where they go because end of the day, um, it's it's their money, but more importantly, it's their health. Right. Yeah. Well, Dr. Atlery, we thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We know that patients who are seeking better health, especially who have chronic back pain, are in good hands with you and, and hopefully we'll be able to see the results of the data of your prospective controlled trial fairly soon. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining in and listening. Uh, Again, this is the uh, Orthobiologics Podcast uh, brought to you by your host, Trevor Turner, MDRMSK uh, here at Georgia Bone & Joint. Be sure to check out Dr. Atluri's website at stemcures.com or check us out on Facebook or Instagram. Thank you so much.